I'm here with Charlie Munger, Vice Chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. Charlie, great to see you. Nice to be here. I want to uh, continue uh, with some of the questions that people were asking you at the annual meeting and start maybe with China and trade and tariffs. And you said that um, even Trump can be right on some of this stuff. Um, well, well, yes, uh, when people get mad enough at one politician, they get thinking everything he says and does is wrong, and that's never the case. What, yeah. what would, go ahead, continue, I'm sorry. And uh, all I said was that you don't want to be such an absolute purist for free trade. I'm almost a purist, but not quite. But I wouldn't want the entire steel industry of the United States to go move offshore. Uh, yeah, there's a some place where you could draw a line without ruining the world. What should our trade policy be then? I mean, yes, China can be unfair, is unfair, but how, would, how should we pursue this? Well, I have an attitude that's entirely different from our president's. I'm glad that we ran a big trade deficit with China that enabled them to rapidly get out of poverty and obscurity. I welcome the Chinese to the group of advanced nations, which I think we enabled considerably by our willingness to, to trade with them as they moved ever upward in terms of complexity of enterprise. So I like what's happened. I don't regard it as unfair and bad. I'm not saying that that it would be unthinkable to have some tariff somewhere. But basically, I'm a free trader, and I'm particularly a free trader in dealing with China. And I like the fact that free trade with China has enabled China to expand so much. And they got out of poverty. They had hundreds of millions of people in rural poverty. And they made huge, in the whole history of the world, no big nation has ever advanced faster than China. And this free trade helped them do it. And I, I like it. But aren't they unfair to us just to follow up on you know, intellectual I, I, property? I'm sure there are places where somebody in China has some advantage over somebody in the United States that you and I might not like perfectly, but that will always happen. But, but basically, the Chinese broke the Berkshire Hathaway shoe business in Maine. It disappeared, basically, because their shoes were very good and cheaper. I'm not mad at China over that. And Berkshire has prospered. It's not so good for Maine, but we, we can't help it. There's no way to make an advanced civilization never hurt anybody as it evolves. There's a lot of talk about an elephant that uh, Berkshire is on the hunt for, a big acquisition. Could that elephant be in China? And if it was, could you even buy it, given the relationship between the two countries right now? I don't think it's likely that we'll be buying any great Chinese companies. The Chinese are very proud of their companies, and they're proud of what they've accomplished. What I consider quite likely is that we will invite, be invited to buy part of some great Chinese company and just because they like the good company. And I think that is very likely to happen at some time. And we would welcome it. We own minority positions in a lot of companies. We own a minority position in BYD. Let me ask you then about BYD and, and Chinese cars. When will Chinese cars be allowed in the United States? And what's holding it up? Is it bureaucracy? Well, it, the, the auto market is very competitive and very fully occupied. And of course, nobody in the United States wants to lose our last two big domestic suppliers, manufacturers of autos. Well, three, if you want to count. Ferrari, Chrysler. And so, it's hard for somebody new to come into the American market big. And, and China has such a big market of its own that my guess is they'll stay busy in their own part of the world for a long time. 
So that's not a priority for BYD? Well, BYD's biggest advantage is in the electric cars, where they are so close to the cutting edge of battery technology. And so they'd be crazy not to emphasize the hybrid in the electric cars over the gasoline cars. Not that they'll go out of the gasoline market, but I think they will be biggest in the hybrid and electric cars. Speaking of electric vehicles, what do you think about Tesla? Um, is that company going to become a major player? Well, it's already created more significance than anybody would have predicted. And its founder is bold and brilliant and swings for the fences. And of course, people like that get some remarkable results and sometimes they get some quick failure. And I haven't the faintest idea how Elon Musk is gonna turn out, but I think he's got a considerable chance of success and a considerable chance of failure. He seems to like it that way. Have you considered overnight Elon Musk getting into the candy business as he suggested he might do on Twitter? I didn't hear that. It sounds like wise assery. <laughs> <laughs> I can't criticize anybody else for wise assery. Um, let's talk about shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the single payer um, healthcare system that you mentioned. And I think you said that the, when the Democrats, if slash when the Democrats control both houses. And the presidency. Oh, it would have to be the, all three. Okay. So, but you really think. I think it will happen. Okay. I mean, you. Yeah. Every other advanced Western nation has it. Different types. No, I don't think my prediction is that radical. So it could happen in two years even then. And I mean, it start pra happening Practically in two years. everybody is disenchanted with the bureaucracy and cost and foolish results in our own culture, our own medical system. Is that an instance where bureaucracy has just taken over an entire industry? Bureaucracy plus entrenched interests that were profiting on, this, on the existing system in various ways. I come from California. If everybody in the nation had Kaiser Healthcare, as we have it in California, the net quality of medicine in the United States would go way up. And Kaiser has never been able to succeed very much outside of California because the entrenched vested interests stomp on it because of its success in California. You're talking about a field where the entrenched interests are making a lot of money, they don't want the change. You wouldn't either if your livelihood depended on it. And so of course it's very hard to change our system. The reason the Singapore system is so much better than ours is they didn't have a lot of entrenched interests that were that powerful and, and they had a brilliant leader and he, the Singapore system costs about a fifth of what ours costs and serves better. Is the healthcare endeavor that you're working on with J.P. Morgan, that Berkshire is working on with J.P. Morgan and Amazon, could that be a template or evolve into a single payer system? No, I think a single payer system comes because the government ordains it. Uh, so I think all they're trying to do is make the existing existing system better. You'll remember that John D. Rockefeller the first, by spending $50 million way back decades ago, utterly revolutionized American medical care. He got all the charlatans out of the medical profession by changing all the state laws, and he had all the medical schools imitate Johns Hopkins, which had imitated Germany, and when his $50 million was spent, the whole of American medicine improved enormously. Now he did that as a public service and, and not many people realize how much public service J.D. Rockefeller I created. And so what Berkshire and its partners are trying to do is a little bit like Rockefeller did. Oh, and that None of them was, would be doing this just to make money. Is this, that this is a public service activity. So that was somewhat of an inspiration? 
Well, it is for me. I don't know. They may have had three different aspirations, but I've always admired what Rockefeller did. And the man who talked him into it, Simon Flexner, also created Einstein's home at the advanced uh, that institute in Princeton. Um, but it was a huge. Bill Gates, who's such an interesting man, all he hopes to do is someday do about half as much as Rockefeller did. <laughs> he knows how what an achievement that was. The timing was perfect. Let me ask you about Wells Fargo. Um, it sounded like you and Warren are standing by your bank at this point. But I, I wonder, you know, at what point is enough enough? Um, and how do you decide when a company is just, okay, this is not going to turn around, we're going to abandon ship here? Well, I don't think for a minute that Wells Fargo is in any way rotten to the core. They just had some incentive programs that, that caused some bad behavior and then they react, re reacted poorly to trouble when it came. So they made mistakes of judgment. But I think you'll find them that they hate what's happened so much that they'll be less likely to make mistakes in the future, not more likely. I actually think this is good for Wells Fargo on a very long-term basis. It's agony to go through, but, but they're going to be better for it. Um, let me ask you about Ted Weschler and Todd Combs. And you and, and especially Warren talk them up and say what great managers they are and, and how smart they are. And I guess the proof will be in the pudding at some point down the road. Um, do you see eye to eye with their investing philosophy? Well, I don't even follow a lot of it. Just because one of them buys some security doesn't mean I start studying it at great length. Eh, but I know them well. They contribute enormously because they're talking to Warren all the time. And as I said at the meeting, he's way better for it. So am I. We would not have bought that Apple stock if one of the young investors had not stared us that way. So does it may have been Warren's conclusion in the end, but it was prompted by one of the young men. They've been enormously constructive, and they help in a whole lot of ways. They both think totally about the shareholder interest. People coming from investment and marketable securities are always thinking about what's good for the shareholders. And they're just a marvelous influence to have somebody, two people, smart and young around Berkshire with that extreme orientation. And they're not just doing pretty well with the money they're investing. They're favorably influencing the investment they're, they're not in charge of. For instance, the Apple investment. But would, in other words, does it change the investing philosophy of Berkshire? So if Berkshire and Warren and you were known as value investors, is that not the core discipline of Berkshire Hathaway anymore, or does that not even matter? Well, you got to remember that in our way of thinking, all intelligent investment is value investment. Because why would you want to buy something which wasn't worth as much as you were paying for it? And who wouldn't like buying something for less than it's worth? So the only difference when people talk about value investor, you're always a value investor. Now there are various ways to look for value investments, just as there are various places to fish. And if the first rule of fishing is to fish where the fish are, the first rule of value investing is to find some place to fish for value investments where there are a lot of them. And of course, it's gotten hard in the United States to find easy value investments because the world is so competitive. And that accounts for a lot of what you see in Berkshire where we buy securities like Apple that we wouldn't have bought in the old days when we had more mundane things that were serving us very well. So 
we're just looking in different places, but we're value investors. And so the some people, when they say value investor, they mean somebody that emphasizes working capital or something, meaning they should you should fish in that particular place. But I think that's all. I think it's a bad use of the language to think there's a difference between value invest investing and other good investing. All good investing is value investing by definition. And, and so, so what, oh, they're just various places to fish for value investments. And of course, as the world gets tougher, you have to fish in places you didn't fish before. And so the idea with Apple then is that there's value there that's unrecognized by the market. Different kind of value investing and one with which we're less familiar. But we wouldn't have bought it if we didn't think it was a good investment. Let me ask you about uh, one of your favorite subjects nowadays, I think maybe it's Bitcoin. And I know you've had some unpleasant things to say about it. But, but is there anything there to it at all, Charlie? I mean, it, should we just dismiss the whole thing? Well, Bitcoin as a, as a the computer science behind, that's behind Bitcoin is a great triumph of the human mind. That's what captivates a lot of these people. They've actually created a product that's hard to create more of, but not impossible. Now that is very peculiar, but they've managed to do it. So a lot of the computer science people love it just because it's such an extreme achievement of computer science. I, of course, have no interest in, in that because it's not my subject. And I see an artificial speculative medium that people are buying just because they think they can sell it to somebody else at a higher price, even though it inherently has no intrinsic value. And so I regard the whole business as antisocial, stupid, immoral. Immoral? Yes, Why immoral. Is that? Why? Why would you trade, suppose you could make a lot of money trading freshly harvested baby brains. Would you do it or would you say that's immoral? You wouldn't trade them, would you? Too, it's too, too, too awful a concept. Well, to me, Bitcoin is almost as bad. It, it's not having any desirable social purpose. We've got debit cards. It isn't like we don't have a payment system. We've got WeChat in China incredibly efficient payment system. China doesn't need Bitcoin. And if you have a WeChat, why would you do it in a medium where the value changes enormously? Nobody in his right mind would want a payment system where the very thing you were using went up and down by 20% in a day. No, I regard the thing as a, as a combination of dementia and immorality. And I think the people that are pushing it are a, a, a disgrace. Last there year, ought to be some things that are beneath you that you just don't do. And this is one. We did not need a gold certificate. I mean, a gold substitute uh, like this. Last year when we talked, Charlie, you mentioned that um, Donald Trump exhibited a form of sickness um, I think is how you characterize it. I think it came, you were characterizing his, his personality and his behavior. Um, it's been another year since he's been in office, and I wonder how you would assess him well, today. Well, I mellowed because I consider it counterproductive to hate as much as both parties now hate, and I have disciplined myself, and I now regard all politicians higher than I used to. I did that as a matter of self-preservation. The other thing I did to make me feel better about the current scene is I reread the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And it goes on for a great many hundreds of pages. And that made me feel a lot better about the current political scene. We're way ahead of the Romans at the end. That's a pretty low bar. Well, I didn't. 
it's very helpful. I suggest you try it. You will feel better about the present world if you look at that one. And you said you elevated politicians yes. to make yourself feel better. Explain not, it's that. It's counterproductive to hate so much. All of us on both sides are getting to hate so much, too much. And I've decided I'm going to back off from that. How do we resolve it? We don't have to resolve it. They all pass. Remember the old saying, this too will pass? They all go away. I have a different rule about politicians. They are never so bad you don't live to want them back. There will come a time when those people who hate Trump will wish that he were back. I don't think I'll live to see it, but I confidently predict that it will happen. That's interesting. Yeah, well, if you look right. at the whole scan of human history mm -hmm. and the people who led it, right. there are a lot of bad leaders. Okay. Um, why don't we leave it at that? Charlie Munger, Vice Chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, thanks very much for taking the time. All right.